tonight. Firm friendship. China Xi welcomes Russia's Putin with pomp and pageantry. The two leaders proving to the world that a friend in need is a friend indeed. Time to talk. Following months of back and forth, Trump and Biden finally sealed the deal with official announcements on not one but two debates precariously closed down to the November rush. Lethal riots. New Caledonia descends into pandemonium as France declares a state of emergency following days of ever escalating tensions among the populace. And standing out, these balls of fluff are a sight of so eyes as the everyday black and white panda steps out of the spotlight to make a way for a different hero. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Derna, World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Good evening, you're joining us on World News Tonight. We have a rundown packed with updates on various events that unfolded across the globe over the course of the past few hours. And we start off with ICE in China. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in Beijing early today for talks with Xi Jinping that the Kremlin hopes will deepen a strategic relationship between the two most powerful geopolitical rivals of the United States. For his first trip abroad since his March re-election, Vladimir Putin was given a red carpet welcome in Beijing. The Russian president is set to discuss trade, diplomacy and the war in Ukraine with his Chinese counterpart at a time where Russia finds itself increasingly isolated on the world stage. Shunned by the West over its invasion of Ukraine, Moscow increasingly relies on Beijing as its key economic partner. Last year, trade between the two nations reached $240 billion. Crucial to Russia has been importing dual-use goods from China, which the U.S. says has helped it continue to produce weapons, despite a slew of international sanctions. China, meanwhile, heavily relies on Russian imports for food and energy. Putin's visit will also allow the two leaders to present a united front in the face of mounting U.S. pressure. The Biden administration recently ramped up sanctions and restrictions against foreign banks and companies that help fund Russia's war machine, threatening to cut them off the global financial system. The move has seen Chinese exports to Russia dip significantly in the past two months, while Chinese banks have slowed transactions with Russian clients. But analysts say Xi and Putin are unlikely to simply turn the other cheek and could be looking for ways to quietly circumvent the sanctions. Well, at the meeting, Chinese President Xi Jinping said China and Russia should further synergize their development strategies and continue enriching bilateral cooperation so as to bring greater benefits to the two countries and people. For more updates on that, we have other than world news special correspondent Minoli Sagaria from Kursk in Russia. Minoli? Yes, we know. Chinese leader Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin pledged to deepen their strategic partnership in Beijing in a stark show of their growing alignment as Russian troops advance in Ukraine. Putin, whose delegation includes top defense and security officials, was welcomed by Xi to Beijing's Great Hall of the People earlier with full military pageantry heralding for the start of his two-day state visit. Xi hailed the two countries' deepening ties, which were formalized in a joint statement inked by the leaders in a ceremony saying they would inject strong momentum in the development of their relations. In meetings with Putin, Xi proclaimed that China-Russian relations have stood the test of a changing international landscape and made positive contribution to maintaining global strategic stability. Back to you, Vinut. Thank you, and that was Adha Dhanabalini Special Correspondent Minoli Sagaria from Kursk in Russia. And on the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, Secretary of State Antony Blinken at a joint press conference in alongside with Kyiv Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kaleba said the United States will provide Ukraine with $2 billion in foreign military financing. The fund will provide weapons for Ukraine today, invest in its defense industrial base and finance military equipment purchases from other countries, he said. Blinken said that the support for Ukraine came at a critical time as the country faces a renewed Russian onslaught. Meanwhile, NATO Military Committee Chief Rob Bauer at a meeting in Brussels said more help on the way to Ukraine as well. Bauer stressed this help cannot come a moment too soon because the time in Ukraine is not measured in days, weeks or months. It is measured in human lives. 
NATO's military committee met to discuss the implementation of defense plans, logistics, air and missile defense, defense industrial capacity and societal resilience while the situation in Kharkiv region is deteriorating. We are back in our region now. In neighboring India, rescue workers have ended their final search for survivors trapped underneath a billboard that collapsed in India's financial capital of Mumbai. Medical welfare teams were checking on those injured and undergoing treatment. The death toll from the accident has risen to 16 and more than 100 people were trapped after a billboard bigger than an Olympic-sized swimming pool crashed on Monday. A fuel station as well as homes and cars were crushed in that accident that happened during a thunderstorm. Rescuers had worked through the night to pull people from the debris on the side of a busy atrial road in the Mumbai suburb of Gadkopar. Maharashtra state chief said in a post on X that a structural audit of all billboards in Mumbai has been ordered to prevent such incidents from occurring again. Still in our region of Asia, we move on to Indonesia now to keep up with the updates of the fatal flooding that devastated the nation. The aftermath is looking grim as survivors of the weekend flash floods and mudslides in the Indonesia's West Sumatra desperately search for their loved ones as the death toll rises. 64-year-old survivor Fitra Wanes waits outside the ruins of her brother's house. Water swept him away when he tried to save his mother-in-law. I hope that his body can be found quickly, either alive or dead. The disaster struck Tana Datar, one of the three districts in West Sumatra, on Saturday evening. On Wednesday, the death toll rose above 60, authorities said. Heavy rains unleashed flash floods, landslides and cold lava flow, a mud-like mixture of volcanic ash, rock debris and water. 23-year-old survivor Rosa Yolanda says she was washed away by the flood. At that time, I was checking my mobile phone and there was a text from my sister who said that she couldn't come home because it was raining heavily. After that, I heard a very loud thunderous sound. Then I turned off my mobile phone. Suddenly, the lights went out and the water rushed in. I didn't have time to stand up and I no longer had time to run and was just washed away by the flood. The National Disaster and Management Agency will continue to search for the missing people and clean the main roads, its head said in a statement on Wednesday. Indonesia's meteorology agency said it planned to try and mitigate heavy rainfall by cloud seeding. Widely used in Indonesia, cloud seeding involves shooting salt flares into clouds to trigger rainfall in dry areas and break up clouds before they reach wetter ones. Authorities expect the heavy rain to continue until next week. And on the Israel-Palestine conflict, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Israel needs a clear and concrete plan for the future of Gaza where it faces the potential for a power vacuum that could become filled by chaos. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was publicly challenged over post-war plans for the Gaza Strip by his own defense chief, who vowed oppose any long-term military rule by Israel over the ravaged Palestinian enclave. In this hospital in Gaza, the wait is interminable, and there are so few places to go for treatment. This little boy was blinded by shelling. The care he needs is not possible here. Doctors say he needs to go abroad by crossing the Rafa border into Egypt. He has the right to treatment. He has the right for medical care. We hope that you will be able to open the Rafa border crossing for the humanitarian cases so that they can receive treatment and be provided with medication so the boy can once again see with his eyes. Prior to Israel taking control of the Rafa crossing towards Egypt on May 7th, it was a vital route for desperately needed humanitarian aid into Gaza. Now empty trucks wait on the Palestinian side, while aid piles up on the Egyptian side. Israel has blamed Egypt for the closure, but Cairo in turn said this was a desperate attempt to shift blame. Human rights groups say the blockade has aggravated an already horrific situation, where famine and death have become the status quo, and basic needs such as water, sanitation and medicine are being withheld. The EU's chief diplomat called on Israel to refrain from further exacerbating the already dire humanitarian situation and to reopen the crossing in Rafah so that at least some aid can begin trickling in again. Well, let's go in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side.
Welcome back. On the road to the White House tonight, the day is finally here. Following months of endless back and forth with provocations from either camp not seeming to lead anywhere ahead of the November US presidential election, Democrat incumbent President Joe Biden and the Republican former President Donald Trump have agreed the two campaign debates. The debates will be held on June 27th and September 10th. Tonight, in a true campaign surprise, President Biden and Donald Trump agreeing to two one-on-one -on -one debates. The first just a few weeks from now, at the end of June, the earliest general election showdown in American history. Trump has been pushing for debates for months. I'm trying to get him to debate. This morning, Biden with this surprise challenge. Donald Trump lost two debates to me in 2020. Since then, he hadn't shown up for debate. Now he's acting like he wants to debate me again. Well, make my day, pal. I'll even do it twice. Biden then taunting Trump, referencing the one day a week that he's not tied up in court. So let's pick the dates, Donald. I hear you're free on Wednesdays. Trump firing back, just tell me when, I'll be there, let's get ready to rumble. I really think he has to debate, he might as well get it over with. Probably yeah. should do it early so that he can, you know, he's not going to get any better. A short time later, the debates were set. The first on June 27th, hosted by CNN, before either candidate is declared the official nominee at their party's convention. And the second on September 10th, hosted by ABC News, just weeks before voters head to the polls. There will be no live audience, just the moderators and the candidates themselves in a television studio, face to face. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden addressed police officers gathered in Washington, D.C. to honor slain colleagues as he tries to prevent his Republican rival Donald Trump from capturing high-profile endorsements from their unions in the coming weeks. We owe you as a nation. You risk your lives every day for the safety of the people you don't even know. That's why each of you, each and every one of you is a hero. Privately, some Biden campaign officials have said that Democrats are losing support among rank-and-file police officers who view the Democratic Party as soft on crime and biased against police when their on-the-job actions come under public scrutiny. Trump, meanwhile, has already won endorsements from statewide police unions in Michigan and Florida. Strategists for Biden, in their case to law enforcement, have highlighted Trump's public support of the violent January 6, 2021 Capitol attack after his defeat in the 2020 election. Despite that, public unions endorsed many more Republican candidates in the congressional midterm elections in 2022 than the previous cycle. Being a police officer is not just what you do, it's who you are. Biden himself has tried to occupy the center on law enforcement issues. He rejected calls by some liberals to defund the police and instead called on local governments to use federal money to hire more officers from the communities they police. But allies have warned his campaign that it must convince voters he is tough on crime. Recent FBI data showed significant drops last year in almost every crime category, including homicides and violent crime from their COVID pandemic era highs. But a Gallup poll last fall found that 63 percent of Americans said crime nationwide was extremely or very serious, up from 54 percent in 2021 and the highest in the survey's history. And now updates on the attempted high-profile assassination that took place in Slovakia now. Slovak President Kaputova called for calm after it was reported that Slovakia's Prime Minister Robert Fico was in a very serious but stable condition after he was shot five times in an assassination attempt that laid bare deep political divisions in the country. Slovak Prime Minister Robert Fico suffered life-threatening injuries when he was shot in an attempted assassination on Wednesday. Fico was in the central town of Hanlova for a government meeting and was shaking hands with a crowd of people when a man near a barricade pulled out a gun and fired. <laughs> Slovak media said the shooter was a 71-year-old man, though the motive was initially unclear. The country's interior minister said it was, quote, politically motivated. The 59-year-old Fizzo was rushed to a local hospital and then transported by helicopter to a regional capital for urgent treatment. Fizzo is no longer in life-threatening condition, according to a government minister. 
Slovakia's President Zuzana Chaputova said she was shocked by the shooting, saying it was, quote, an attack on democracy. The leftist prime minister returned to his role last October for the fourth time. He has drawn criticism for taking a more pro-Russian stance in the Ukrainian war, as well as initiating reforms of criminal law and the media, which have raised concerns over weakening the rule of law. The shooting has drawn international condemnation from U.S. President Joe Biden, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and other European leaders. The pandemonium continues as France declared a state of emergency on the Pacific island of Caledonia after three young indigenous Karnak and a police official were killed in the riots over electoral reform. Government spokesperson Prisa Tevenot says that decrease goal is to bring back calm and serenity. This video shows a chaotic scene unfold in New Caledonia. A gunshot sounds and then a man is seen on the ground. In another video, a victim is covered with a blue cloth. New Caledonia has spiralled out of control. Here, this injured man is being carried away. Protesters aren't being shot by the police, but by other New Caledonians trying to protect their homes. They're now grouped together to defend themselves. The High Commissioner called for an end to the violence. The demand for peace must be heard by everyone, both sides. We have entered into a dangerous spiral, a deadly spiral. These residents of Noumea have been pushed to the edge. After 24 hours of physical violence and the destruction of their property, they decided to barricade the suburb. All we're trying to do is to protect our homes against people who set everything on fire, businesses too. They are in the midst of destroying the country, so we have to defend ourselves. At the moment, there's nothing dangerous here. We don't have any firearms. Many living in anxiety, barricaded in their homes. The suburb was burnt and looted. Demonstrators insulted us. It's been very difficult to live here since Monday. Like all Caledonians, we're shocked by what's happening. We're scared for our lives. This police station was destroyed late on Wednesday. Residents go to petrol stations and pharmacies to stock up. Well, the European Union urged Georgia to withdraw its highly contested foreign agents bill, saying the measure would be to set back the nation's ambitions to join the bloc as protests against the legislation continued in a rolling political crisis. An EU statement, which came after the third and final reading of the bill in Georgia's parliament a day earlier, urged authorities to withdraw the law, saying it was, quote, not in line with EU core norms and values, and, quote, negatively impacts Georgia's progress on the EU path. The bill would require organizations receiving more than 20 percent of their funding from abroad to register as agents of foreign influence. It imposes onerous disclosure requirements and punitive fines for violations. The draft law has been dubbed the Russian law by opponents, who compare it to legislation used by the Kremlin for the past decade to crack down on its opponents. For many young Georgians, the fight represents a stark choice over whether Georgia should integrate with Europe or rebuild old ties with Russia. The prospect of EU membership is widely popular in Georgia, and despite recent anti-Western rhetoric, the ruling party says it wants the country to join both the EU and NATO. EU leaders agreed in December to grant Georgia the status of a membership candidate on the understanding that it completes nine steps, including reducing political polarization. Diplomats said the bill clearly did not fit with that aim. The ruling Georgian Dream Party says the law is necessary to ensure the transparency of foreign funding for NGOs. A short commercial break now, more world news right after this. Welcome back. When we think of pandas, our mind immediately gravitates to their distinct colors, well, black and white. Well, here's a fun fact. These balls of fluff come in more than one variation. And after six years in the shadows, a rare panda of a special kind has been caught on camera in China. The slow stroll of what appears to be a mother and baby panda was seen on surveillance video in the Chongqing National Nature Reserve. And before you check, there's nothing wrong with the color on your screen. Rather than the cuddly looking black and white pandas most people are used to, these pandas are dark brown and light brown. 
This rare breed, called the Chinling Giant Panda, was just recognized in 2005 after being photographed for the first time in 1985. According to the Journal of Mammalogy, beyond the difference in color, the brown pandas are also slightly smaller than their black and white cousins and have less fur. Their bamboo diet and behavior is the same as the typical giant panda. Just the sight of this pair has animal experts excited. The camera-shy Chinling giant panda hasn't been seen in this area since 2018. So far, they've only been found in the Chinling Mountains, living at high altitudes over 4,000 feet. Estimates say there are anywhere from 200 to 300 brown pandas in the wild. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Until then, thank you for watching. Have a good night.